everyone and welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Shweta Mishra and today I'm honored to have with us our eminent guest expert, Dr. Cindy Duke of Nevada Fertility Institute, who specializes not only in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, but is also a research award winning virologist and lab director whose work has focused on interaction of viruses with the human system. Uh, Dr. Duke is also a producer of a number of online programs aimed at debunking myths surrounding infertility, including her own podcast called Girl Powered Success and Survival International. Dr. Duke is here with us to help us with answers to some very burning questions and burst myths around the use of COVID-19 vaccines in women who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to conceive. Questions that many women are confused about due to the unavailability of clinical trials data on COVID-19 vaccines in this population. So Dr. Duke, thank you so much for finding time to be here with us today and educate us and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and happy Wednesday to everybody. <laughs> hey, great. Co-hosting with me on the panel of fertility patient experts are Davina Fankhauser and Valerie Landis. Thanks for joining Davina and Valerie. Thanks for your patience. And it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. So to all those who are watching us live, we will be taking in questions at the end of the discussion based on the availability of time. So please add your questions to the comment section of QTalks.com page, or you can also email me at shweta at trialx.com. So Dr. Duke, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines rollout began in mid-December 2020. And since then, uh, many pregnant and breastfeeding women and those who are trying to conceive have taken the vaccines. Still, there is a widespread confusion and women still have concerns whether or not to take the vaccine or which one is the best to take. So perhaps it'll be good to start with an overview of the vaccines. And we know that Johnson & Johnson vaccine was approved a few days back. So could you tell us about that Johnson & Johnson vaccine? How is it different from the other vaccines that were approved earlier and would be great if you could touch upon the kind of vaccines that is preferable for women who are pregnant, breastfeeding and uh, trying to conceive. Uh, because we do have an audience question asking that there are more side effects to Moderna compared to Pfizer. Is it true? Well, certainly the it's really good news, guys, uh, that we have vaccine candidates. That's exciting. The last time I was here on the show, we didn't have a vaccine in sight at the time. So it's really, really a good place to be. Right now in the United States, we have three vaccines which have been authorized. We have Pfizer and Moderna, both of which are mRNA vaccines, which essentially is a D, an RNA code within a little fat bubble. And it codes for the spike protein, which is the spikes that you see on top of the virus anytime you see a model of it. And the spike protein, of course, is what the virus actually uses to bind to your cells to get into your body. And so we're the vaccines are designed against that protein and the Pfizer, Moderna, and even the Johnson & Johnson vaccine all code for the spike protein. The difference between Pfizer and Moderna, which are mRNA vaccines, compared to the Johnson & Johnson slash AstraZeneca vaccines, which are adenovirus vector vaccines, is how they get into a cell. So with the mRNA vaccines, again, it's just a tiny fat bubble that encodes the, what, the machinery that's needed for making mRNA that is going to code for spike protein. So the way that gets into the cell is the fat bubble will cross through your cell's membrane because your cell membrane also composes of, it's comprised of different fat bubbles. And so the fat bubble crosses and it releases the mRNA. Your cells, proteins and enzymes immediately start making protein from the mRNA code and it makes the spike protein. So the spike protein that's being made is being made from your amino acids. It's being modified using your cells proteins and sugars to form the protein, which is the spike protein. So what's interesting is the code is one long set of letters. Once it's created and read, the amino acids, when they're put together, stitched together to make the protein, then they start folding around each other to form what we call the three-dimensional structure of the spike protein. And that three-dimensional structure is what eventually will be taken up to the surface of your cell and your plasma cells, which are B cells that make antibodies, will notice it, recognize it, and specialize to create antibodies against the spike protein. In addition to that, as the amino acid 
read out, comes out, it gets chopped up into smaller pieces known as peptides. Those peptides also go to the surface of your cell and your T cells recognize the peptides. And that's how your T cells then learn what it needs to know for the next time it sees the spike protein again. And so that's how immunity is built. That's how the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines get into the cell. In terms of adenovirus, so adenoviruses are a family of viruses which can cause flu-like illnesses, pink eye in their native state. A viral vector means we take some native virus and then we strip it of anything that can make it infectious, anything that can help it make it more of itself. So the vectors have been stripped of their replication machinery is what we say, meaning they can't make more of themselves, but we, they have enough code to actually package themselves into looking like their usual virus. In the case of the vaccine candidates, these viruses have been stripped of the ability to make more of themselves, stripped of what makes them actually disease causing or pathogenic. And the code that was stripped from them was replaced with a code for the spike protein. And so what you have is basically an adenovirus shuttling in the code for the spike protein. And once it gets into a cell, it releases that and then it has enough to just make more of that mRNA to produce protein from it, that spike protein. So adenoviruses have been around forever. Adenovirus vectors have been around forever. In the case of the J&J vaccine, the big thing when you're thinking about an adenovirus is because they've been around forever, you have to worry that maybe the humans you're giving it to could have immunity to it already if they've been exposed. So the novel vaccines are actually using adenovirus vectors that were from a chimpanzee, meaning they infect chimpanzees historically. So what that means is for human beings, we should be immune naive. Our immunity should not have seen that type of adenovirus before. And that's what makes it novel. And so it means then that if you inject someone with it, their immune system won't neutralize it before it can actually get into a cell to make more of the spike protein. And so that's what the adenovirus vectors are. And once they get into a cell, the mRNA is released and the same process as what would happen with Pfizer or Moderna will then take place. You'll make spike protein, antibodies will see the 3D structure and now they can become specialized for the spike protein. The little peptides will be created and now um, you can actually have uh, T cells that are educated to recognize the peptides or the strips of the spike protein. Okay, and um, uh, do you think, uh, do you prefer any particular vaccine for pregnant and breastfeeding women or people who are trying yes. to conceive? So if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, I recommend the mRNA vaccines, which would be Pfizer and Moderna. While the J&J vaccine is an excellent candidate for people who are not pregnant, we don't recommend it in pregnancy right now. And that's because we really don't recommend any viral vectored um, anything live attenuated or viral vector once you're pregnant. And that's because these viral vectors can sometimes cross placenta, et cetera. It's just not worth the question. Where else, yeah. when you deal with the mRNA vaccines, when they're injected, so we get the Pfizer and the Moderna in the arm, they quickly are taken up by the cells that are local to the area where they've been injected. The protein is made and the mRNA is degraded right away. So it does not make its way through your body to get to the placenta. It does not. Right. Secondly, it's actually been studied. So we know that mRNA doesn't cross the mRNA vaccines. They don't cross the placenta in animal models. Um, they also don't compromise a pregnancy in animal models. And secondly, in the actual vaccines that have been done so far, folks who have gotten the vaccine, so persons who got the vaccine and then became pregnant had no bad outcomes. On top of that, their chance of getting pregnant was no different from folks who did not get the vaccine, who got the placebo. So very important. Right. Thank you. That was very helpful, doctor. Um, uh, um, I guess uh, it will be really great if you also talk a little bit about the placental protein sensitin one that was in uh, news um, lately uh, due to the... and it. it I think it was published in some blog which said that it can be harmful for pregnant women and their fetuses. So can the vaccine at all induce immune reactions against the placenta? Is, is there any basis to that claim and should women be worried about it? Yeah, there's no basis to that claim. That really truly was a rumor and we can even say it was a lie. Um, the 
premise behind the video was very much misleading. It was intent on just propagating mistruth. So syncytin-1 is a protein that does have some similarities in the code between lots of different proteins. But remember what I was saying that when it comes to proteins, actually, and antibodies, because the whole rumor online was that you can make antibodies against syncytin-1. But the truth is, when a protein is formed, it doesn't stay linear, right? So it's read out, but it doesn't stay linear. In fact, it, it's much like this cord. First, it's created, the code is read, and then the amino acids fold up on each other to form a three-dimensional structure. Okay. And that three-dimensional structure is what antibodies recognize because they have to bind what's called an epitope. So you need a 3D structure. So the 3D structure that's formed by spike protein is very different. There are no similarities between spike protein's 3D structure and the three-dimensional structure of syncytin-1. Therefore, the concern about antibodies recognizing spike protein and also recognizing the placenta, not true. So the vaccine does not pose a risk for either miscarriage or... Um, or infertility, to be clear. But secondly, actually the risk of miscarriage and pregnancy issues are actually, we're seeing it more in people who are pregnant and got COVID-19. And that's because of the inflammation that COVID-19 causes at the level of the placenta that leads to um, inflammation that causes degradation of the placenta that leads to blood clots at the level of the placenta. And so, Getting COVID-19 is actually more risky and more detrimental to someone who's pregnant or recently delivered and breastfeeding as compared to someone who got the vaccine where the vaccine actually helps to give you immunity so you can prevent infection and prevent serious illness. Thank you. Thank you for that very helpful explanation, Doctor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think I'll now move on to Valerie. Uh, Valerie has been working in the women's healthcare field for the last decade now, and she focuses on guiding women through challenging uh, parts of infertility decisions through her website, experiences.com. Valerie, please go ahead and ask your questions. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Duke, so recently the ASRM guidelines released, I think it was last month, that pregnant women can choose to be vaccinated or not. Um, maybe can you talk through some of the pros and cons that a woman might be considering if she's going to get the vaccine, especially if she's pregnant, or is it better to wait until after the pregnancy and she's safely delivered the child? And um, what are some of the risks that uh, she would have getting the vaccine at what trimester that she's in? So the first thing I wanna say is getting the vaccine really is a personal choice and one that should be made in discussion and conversation with your doctor. And I say personal choice because, you know, we know that historically pregnant women and pregnant persons do have more hesitancy and reluctance to get vaccines. Even with the flu vaccine, only about 50% of pregnant persons take the flu vaccine each year, even though it's recommended for all pregnant persons. So based on that recognition, I'm entering this conversation already understanding that some of our pregnant patients no matter what we say today, we'll not be convinced to get the vaccine. And that's okay. That's okay. If you don't get the vaccine, I will go over all the things you should be doing to stay safe, whether you're vaccinated or not. And that is something I hope to emphasize today. But let's talk about the vaccines first. So in terms of vaccines, we're recommending the mRNA vaccines because we know they have an excellent safety profile. We know that the immune response induced from it is also safe. We know also when you compare vaccine versus no vaccine, the risk of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 disease is tremendously higher in pregnant persons compared to non-pregnant persons of the same age. If you couple that with a, being a pregnant person who's considered to be in a high risk group. So pregnancy itself is considered high risk, but then we have people who are pregnant but have other risk factors on top of that. So for example, if you have diabetes, 
whether it's gestational diabetes or pre-gestational diabetes, meaning if you had diabetes before you became pregnant, or if you're someone who developed diabetes in pregnancy, we see worse outcomes if you developed COVID-19 while pregnant. We see the same thing in those with underlying high blood pressure, those with underlying weight issues, uh, obesity. We see it with those with underlying lung issues. And so if you have any of those risk factors, you should give strong consideration to getting the vaccine. In addition to that, if you work in healthcare, if you're a frontline worker, and so our frontline workers, usually each state has designated who is considered to be a frontline worker. So I recommend checking in with your local state authorities to see what risk level you've been stratified into. Um, teachers, some teachers, um, if you're working in person particularly, you're considered a frontline worker, or flight attendants are frontline workers, certainly are emergency medical um, EMTs and store workers, etc. So if you're a frontline worker, you should definitely, definitely be considering getting the vaccine. Uh, if you have underlying health conditions, you should consider getting the vaccine. If you live with people who are considered high risk, you should consider getting the vaccine. Why do I say that? Well, I have had a number of my patients, for example, who at first said, well, doc, I'm working out of the house. I really only leave the house to go to my OB visits and I'm home and I won't be going out until it's time to deliver. However, their spouse or their family members who live in the house might actually be high risk or going back and forth into high risk situations where they become exposed and can bring the virus home to you. And so in that case, again, you may want to get vaccinated and definitely those around you should get vaccinated. So that's the other layer, right? If you decide in the end that you're not going to get vaccinated, strongly consider having those around you in your circle get vaccinated to decrease your risk of exposure. I mean, that's part of the reason why I got my vaccine as soon as I could. I did it not just for my own protection, but to protect my patients, my staff, and my family. And so that would be one reason to encourage your family members to get it if you chose not to. Um, when to get the vaccine. So we're recommending that you get the vaccine as soon as it becomes available. So that means if you're pregnant, getting the vaccine when pregnant. Again, the mRNA vaccines are safe in so much as we know, but we know a lot. So mRNA vaccines in general have been around and been in use over the last 10 years in different settings. While they weren't being used for COVID, they were being used for Ebola, they've been used in chikungunya, um, they've been used in a, in a number of clinical trials for cancer. And so we have data from those cases where people did go on to become pregnant later on and did well, feared well, their pregnancies went well. In the context of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 vaccine trials, in the Pfizer trial, for example, they actually had people who went on to become pregnant shortly after getting the vaccine and the pregnancies have gone well. No increased rates of miscarriage in those who were vaccinated with the vaccine candidate versus those who got what we call the placebo. Um, so that's really good news. In addition to that, they have, at this point, some births are being reported did okay. And so we have that. In addition to that, um, the BioNTech vaccine, not by Moderna, the Moderna vaccine, actually they studied it in pregnant rats. And so, mind you, they're not humans, but in pregnant rats, they saw no negative outcomes from vaccination in that model compared to the ones who did not get vaccinated. So that's, to be honest, for a lot of the data we use to determine drug safety, et cetera, in pregnant persons, most of the things we're using is extrapolated data from smaller animals. And so that's the other thing is if someone's wondering, well, why are we trusting the data from rats? To be perfectly honest, in many of the things we use in pregnancy right now, the data came from other animals. Um, we do know that the vaccine studies have now started, including pregnant persons. So we will actually have data on humans coming, but so far it's all reassuring.
when to get it. So I've been recommending if you're already pregnant, go ahead and get your vaccine when it's available, the mRNA vaccine. So that's Pfizer and that's Moderna. If you're planning pregnancy, I have been encouraging my patients to go ahead and get the vaccine when available and complete the series. So what that means is if it's Pfizer, you get your first vaccine and then three weeks later, you get your second shot. If it's Moderna, you get your first, four weeks later, your second shot and then start trying after that. Um, and it's really just to get it out of the way, get the questions out of the way. If you're not pregnant yet, delay for a little bit, get that out of the way. If you're already pregnant, go ahead. And I have quite a few of my own patients who got their vaccines after embryo transfer while waiting for their pregnancy test and have tested positive and have now cleared their first trimester and doing well. We have those who have gotten the vaccine and had insemination cycles and have fared well. Um, the emphasis on getting it during pregnancy is twofold. One, if you got your vaccine, as you build immunity, your antibodies can actually cross the placenta. And that is how most newborn babies get their immunity in the first three to six months of life. So when a baby is born, their own immune system isn't mature enough yet to make enough antibodies for themselves, make enough strong T cells for themselves. The truth is their immune system is still maturing. And so when they're born, the immunity they're born with is actually with a lot of what crossed the placenta to give them the immunity to face the world. And so if you got your vaccine during pregnancy and you built antibodies, it'll cross the placenta and now your baby has antibodies as well, which is amazing. Um, similarly, uh, when it comes to breast milk, we know, for example, if someone were infected with COVID-19, we can find neutralizing antibodies against COVID-19 in their breast milk. So the presumption would be that with a vaccine, the same thing will happen. You'd have neutralizing antibodies. We also know from other viral infections that moms, um, or per, well, not just moms, but whomever is making milk, who was vaccinated or was infected can actually make T cells as well that are in the breast milk to give the baby that first set of immunity as well and to help prime baby's gut really to help protect the gut from infection. So I recommend it I, if possible before delivery, you know, like during pregnancy, but certainly if you're offered it postpartum at the hospital at your birthing center, consider getting the vaccine before heading home as well. So that leads into my, my next question about if you are pregnant, does that increase your risk of getting COVID and um, how would that affect a newborn or a baby in utero? Um, and you kind of touched on how the placenta is, um, if there's antibodies that it's, it's crossing the lines with the placenta, but could you share a little bit more about does that increase your risk that if you don't have the vaccine that you could potentially get COVID? Yeah, so we know that the risk of becoming infected in a pregnant person is no different from someone who's not pregnant. But what is the higher is the risk of developing severe disease if you developed COVID, right? Because to be clear, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that you're infected with, but then if you developed illness and actually had symptoms, that's called COVID-19. And what we know is if someone's pregnant and gets COVID-19, the pregnant persons tend to do worse than someone who's the same age, same weight, same underlying history, but wasn't pregnant and got COVID. And so it's important to know that. Um, other things though, if you're a smoker while pregnant, while smoking has all its other risks, it definitely amplifies your risk um, for COVID-19 and poor COVID-19 outcomes. Same goes for diabetes, et cetera. So what I say is while we don't think you're just going to, if you're in the same room with your family members, now you're at increased risk of getting infected. But what we do know is you're more likely to get sicker than when, if you were not pregnant at the time. So that's important to know. Um, what was the other part of your question, Valerie? Um, just like with the placenta, how it crosses, uh, does a vaccine help the unborn child then also have immunity? 
Yes. So we know antibodies or IgG crosses the placenta. That's been the historical uh, basis for a lot of what we do when it comes to, for example, recommending the flu shot in pregnancy is so that, again, you can have those antibodies cross and help protect your baby. Now, what's cool about that is it also means if you were to become infected around the time of delivery, where we've seen cases of people becoming infected around the time of delivery, if you had been vaccinated, now your baby is protected even as it's exposed to that infection, as it's traversing the birth canal, and certainly when it's coming out through your body. And it's also going to be protected against anyone it's exposed to if they're asymptomatic but infectious, right? Um, so that's one. But the other is you're giving that baby the immunity it needs before it's born. Of course, if you're breastfeeding or pumping, we will also presume you're adding to the immunity. You're sort of topping up the immunity every time you breastfeed or pump milk for uh, the infant. And that would be great because really for the first six months of life, the baby is dependent in large part on the antibodies it got from you. And to be clear, antibodies hang around for about 12 weeks, right? So if you if you have an antibody that crossed the placenta, it's going to hang around with the baby for 12 weeks, which is why if you were exposed and you have antibodies and keep making them, then you're constantly helping out your little kiddo as well. Great. And then my final question kind of goes off of if you did already have COVID, let's say you pretty much know that you had it, whether you got tested or not, should you still get the vaccine, especially if you're a woman in reproductive years that haven't had a child yet? What's the pros and cons on that? And um, is that a major consideration for pregnancy in the future? So, you know, the good news is if you got infected, yes, you build some immunity and you have some antibodies. The downside of that news is because you are usually infected, sick, your body's trying to fight off the entire virus, not just the spike protein. It was generating antibodies and T cells against every part of the virus. So it wasn't really focusing on amplifying one particular part. That said, we know the spike protein is the most critical part of the virus when it comes to its ability to infect cells and propagate itself. And so if you were infected, yay, you have some immunity. But if you got the vaccine, now you're going to be able to really specify and target the immunity. And so you're going to be able now to really amplify out that spike protein immunity. And that only helps you in the long run because it's even better than before. And so that's how I like to describe it is your think of your infection as being a, 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 a prelude, right? It invites your immune system to recognize that this thing shouldn't be there. But the problem is, and that's the whole concept of going viral, when you're first infected, as somebody who did not have immunity, your immune system took somewhere between 10 to 12 days to actually recognize something was going on. And that's part of why the cytokine storm happens. It's because first, your body has to get used to figuring out what this new thing is. Then it recognizes it's wrong. It amplifies its immune self by making more anti bodies that are specific for all the different proteins from the virus. It's making T cells. Eventually you have enough of those, but it's now 10 to 12 days now. And the virus the whole time has been making more of itself and spreading to more of your cells in your body. So your immune system is now thinking, oh my gosh, I have a widespread problem. Let's just attack. And that's the cytokine storm. And so with cytokine storm, your other things get suppressed. Your bone marrow starts getting weakened, your heart, your kidneys, et cetera. So your body is also having to now figure out how to use the immune system to heal itself while fighting off an infection. So it's really unlikely that you mounted a super, super, super strong response that's specific. And so that's really what the vaccine is going to do for you. It's going to boost the specific part, which is the anti-spike protein part. That can never hurt in the long run when it comes to vaccine. So my short answer to that long-winded description is yes, I recommend getting the vaccine as a booster, even if you were infected previously. Um, we know that because like, of what I just described, many people have sort of a, a weakened or a temporary immunity to it. And that's why some people actually get infected again. And some people have been infected three, four times. And it's because of just all the things your immune system has to do during an infection versus vaccine, you're healthy, 
It can recognize it and expand right away and be very focused about what it's expanding. Right. I, thank you. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, Dr. Cindy. Um, great questions, Valerie. Um, I think I'll now move on to Davina, uh, a former fertility patient and co-founder of fertilitywithinreach.org. Davina has participated in and led strategic efforts to access infertility benefits since 2005. And she has co-authored legislation and lobbied at the state level in Washington, DC, as well as insurance industry. And with uh, she does it all with the ultimate goal of helping the underserved get access to fertility care benefits. Davina, please go ahead with your questions. I think she's muted. Unmute. Yes. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Duke, it's very nice to meet you. And I appreciate all the information you're sharing with us. I recently saw a notice from a state department that said COVID, the COVID vaccine would not cause infertility. And I was a little bit skeptical of this because people usually have to try to conceive for a certain period of time before they're even um, diagnosed with infertility. So given the timeline, how could they definitively say that the vaccine does not cause infertility? And do you think it's true? I think it's true. I agree with you, it's a short timeline, but we actually have some really interesting information, which was, one, in the trials, there actually were people who were trying to conceive, it turned out, um, not maybe necessarily having planned it when they started with the vaccine, but they went on to get pregnant. So clearly they weren't necessarily preventing it. And so, for example, in the Pfizer trial, there were 36 people who conceived. And um, in looking at the timeline, compared to other people who got pregnant, it was no different. And so it's based on that small study, but again, Sad to say, when it comes to a lot of things related to pregnancy and fertility, they're based on small studies. They're based on small cohorts. And so um, we will have more data, but based on everything I know about coronaviruses, everything I know about spike protein, everything I know about mRNA technology, and again, that technology has been around for well over 10 years. Um, it does not cause infertility. It does not cross the placenta. As a matter of fact, it does not get to the level of your ovaries or your testicles is really the key to know as well. So we're injecting it in the arm, in the deltoid muscle. Um, when you inject the small lipid particles, they quickly get picked up by what we call antigen presenting cells. That's where the protein gets made in those cells and then it gets presented to the cells that make antibodies and the T cells, which are our fighter cells when it comes to viral infections. And so it, and it also is degraded very quickly, the mRNA itself. So it's not circulating in our body. It's not going to our brain. It's definitely not making its way to our reproductive organs. Now I know people are probably thinking, well, is that really true? I got a headache after I got my vaccine. I had bone pain after I got my vaccine. So what does she mean? It doesn't go to play. Places. Yes, you got a headache, but the headache wasn't in response to mRNA going to your brain. It was actually your immune response, getting ready to prepare to fight what it thinks is a foreign thing in the arm. The bone pain is because your immune cells are made in your bone marrow. And so if you have an antigen or a foreign thing in your body and your body is like, oh, we have to make more, the place that's going to make more of the cells that make antibodies, that's going to make more T cells cells is your bone marrow. So that bone pain, the chills, the shivers, the soreness that people describe the general body ache, that's part of it. That's what that is. The swelling that you feel in your arm post injection is your lymphatic system rushing into the arm. Well, lymphatics is what your white cells travel through. And so, you know, for me, for example, when I got my vaccine, I was excited when I felt the swelling. I was excited when I thought I was getting a fever. Ultimately, I didn't get a fever, but you know, the immunology, virology nerd in me was like, yes, it's doing something. <laughs> Now, the truth is it doesn't do the same thing in everybody. So like, I thought I would get a fever. I never got a fever. I didn't take Tylenol or anything. I just didn't get a fever. Um, I was waiting for the body aches that everybody describes. I didn't really get body aches. I slept extra, but I needed the sleep I decided. So that was good, but I did sleep more in the, especially the second dose, I got the Pfizer vaccine. And so I was a little bit more 
Like I went to bed earlier for the maybe four to five days post my second vaccine on January 11th. Um, but that made sense to me because again, your body wants you to rest so it can really focus on making the things it needs to fight off what it perceives to be foreign. And so um, those reactions are normal they're expected. And the truth is, if we're really honest about things, if we've been vaccinated before, you feel the same thing when you get the flu shot, the tetanus shot, the, um, you think of any viral vaccine in particular, you feel those things because that is your immune system activating to come do what it's supposed to do. And so that's what I would tell people. Um, But the fertility question, it's based on a small number, but it makes sense. It's also, though, based on what we know about the existing technology. So we are extrapolating some data, but it's strong enough data to extrapolate. Thank you so much. And I have another question. Um, I saw a study um, that Mm -hmm. was conducted in Florida that suggested there could be a correlation between having COVID and a negative impact on male fertility. The researchers said that more studies were needed, but it looked like COVID could have a similar impact as mumps or HIV. I was wondering two questions. One, do you know if any other studies have followed up on this? And two, if it is true, could this concern translate to the vaccination? You know, if it's true, was it the mRNA that uh, led to this issue, so forth? So if you could kind of help us understand that better. So I saw that study. Um, There are also a number of studies, um, a small one that came out of Iran. There were a couple reports that came out of China as well as one out of Italy. So if you take them all together, we start building and painting a picture of COVID-19, meaning infection and severe illness in a patient born with testicles. So what we know is This is a little bit morbid, but in patients who've actually passed away from COVID-19 in pathological post-mortem sections of the testicles, they were actually able to identify virus and viral particles, which would support that the virus spread everywhere, which makes sense if someone has what we call viremia, the virus is going everywhere. And ultimately that is part of what leads to death. What they also saw though was lots of inflammatory cells, which also is what we expect to see if you have virus somewhere and your immune system recognizes it, it's sending in inflammatory cells trying to fight that off. And that's also what we're seeing at the level of the uterus and the placenta, for example, in a pregnant person who um, gets COVID-19. So in the testicle, what they saw were large numbers of immune cells, which likely means your immune system went into fight. Um, What we know is as inflammatory cells flood to some place. You can also have compromise of blood vessels, et cetera. So you can have blood clots, which means blood flow is compromised. And so certainly what we see this is about to be really scary for those who were born with a penis. They also see penile dysfunction, right? And that would also support this poor blood flow, likely some thrombocytosis happening, which is like blood clots at the level of the penis and the testicle. And so any of that would lead to breakdown of the sperm production machinery. So for example, that's what happens with mumps is mumps can go to the testicles. If it's infected there, the inflammatory response certainly leads to death of the cells that take that are supposed to make sperm, you know, because the testicles are a little bit different from the ovaries in that the testicles have these specialized cells that have to make sperm for the rest of that testicles existence. Whereas in an ovary, when the ovary is formed, the eggs are formed, and then you're born with the eggs, you don't make new ones, you just have to maintain them going forward. And so you can have loss of those cells. So that's what we've seen so far in all the studies. What we've also seen, though, is there seems to be a rebound period, meaning after infection, for those who've recovered, 90 days or so, you start seeing 
rebound in the sperm counts in these small studies. And I keep saying small because they're truly small. They're like 16 patients. One of them is like 31 patients. They're small studies, but it's enough for us to say, and certainly what I've already been telling my patients. So if the sperm producing partner actually had COVID and was sick, and let's say we were planning to do a semen analysis, I say, let's wait 60 days until they're fully recovered before we do the semen analysis, because we know one, it takes 70 days to make new sperm. And so if the testicles were compromised, it's going to take a good 70 days, even after the symptoms have resolved for us to see resumption and a healthy stock of sperm. So I say wait at least 60 days, but we're probably going to end up needing to wait 90 plus. Um, so what I do is if I have a patient who had COVID, um, they're 60, 70 days out, we're doing a semen analysis. If the semen analysis looks horrible, meaning abnormal, I don't just say, oh, you now have abnormal sperm. I say, let's repeat and two more months to see where we are while that person is recovering. We also know that there's now COVID long hauler syndrome. And we know that there are some people who also just make viral particles for an extended long time, or the DNA's present at least, for extended periods of time, even after their symptoms have resolved. So that is still needed to be characterized, which is if they're still viral genome in their system? Is it also still persisting in semen? Um, but that's really all based on infection, right? So that's different from vaccine. Now with the vaccine, again, the antibody response is being generated, but it's being generated in the case of the mRNA vaccines, at least, from what's happening in the arm. Um, in the case of the adenovirus vectored vaccines, enough hasn't been studied in terms of long-term outcomes. What the expectation would be that adenoviruses don't really cause specific things in the testicle based on what we know about them. Um, in terms of spiking of fever, et cetera, we know any systemic illness in a person with testicles can lead to temporary changes in sperm counts, but then they recover. So if you had even a common cold um, that happens, if you've had the flu, we know that happens. And so typically, just like we would say with any other infectious process or high inflammatory response process is wait maybe 60 days before you get your testing done. Thank you. Now I, I have one last question, which I think you answered a little bit already, but it has to do with breastfeeding. I remember when I was breastfeeding and I had to take a certain medication, I had to stop breastfeeding for a couple of days. So I'm wondering, is there a certain amount of time that a woman should stop breastfeeding after receiving a dose, either the first, second, or perhaps the only dose of the vaccine? Yeah. So that's called the pump and dump. Um, yeah. we, right. The mRNA, we haven't recommended pumping and dumping um, because, again, the mRNA itself is not going to make itself into the breast milk or into the bloodstream in that way. Um, the antibodies, actually, you're conferring antibodies to the baby. So that's kind of what we want. Um, in terms of the j, &J vaccine, I, at this point, I don't see it being authorized to be used in someone who's actively breastfeeding, or at least recently delivered. But if you were someone who ended up with it, it should still presumably be safe, but I don't see it being authorized. So I actually don't want to say anything on it because I think that's premature, but also um, unlikely to be the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. My uh, pleasure. Thank you, Devina. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Cindy. I think I'll now move on to uh, Erica's question. Erica was supposed to join us, but she had you know, um, she just had her baby and she could not join the talk, but she really has some great questions about breastfeeding and the vaccines. So she wanted to ask, um, she says, I've heard concerns raised about what additives and preservatives are there in the vaccines. Is there anything in either vaccine that could get into my breast milk and impact my baby's health? Mm -hmm. Actually, so I know people have always been concerned about adjuvants in vaccines, um, with the biggest one being concerned for something called thimerosal. Um, we have actually 
remove thimerosal from vaccines that are given to pregnant, breastfeeding, or children under six years old. So there is no thimerosal, even in the flu vaccine that's used specifically for pregnant persons and children under six, they're thimerosal free. And I think it's important for people to know that. Um, and certainly, I tell my patients anyway, I say when you're going to get your vaccine, if you're planning pregnancy, tell them you want thimerosal free vaccine. Now thimerosal is not in either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine at all. So it's not even an option. It's not in there. On top of that, the only additive really is polyethylene glycol, PEG. But you know what's interesting? If you've ever used Miralax, which is for constipation, et cetera, that's the active ingredient in Miralax. And Miralax has long been safe for pregnant persons, has long been safe for people who are postpartum, who have constipation. So, and when you're taking Miralax, you're taking like a scoopful. In the vaccine, it's just a few particles of that. So yes, it's safe. Um, it won't harm you if it were to get into breast milk. But again, it should not get into breast milk because of just how tiny the dose is, one, where it's being injected and how quickly the mRNA vaccine is degraded in your cells. So really and truly, it should not be getting into breast milk at all. I recognize that it's a concerning thought, but it's one that shouldn't, mechanistically, it won't happen. Um, and again, polyethylene glycol is actually Miralax. I want people to remember that. Right. Thank you, doctor. Um, the second one says, looking back through the history of vaccines, has there ever been reported cases where a vaccine administered to the mother negatively impacted her breastfeeding baby? Uh, no, we know sometimes uh, vaccines, same thing, infection. If a mom were infected and she spiked a fever, you might see a fever in her baby too. Um, but you don't see the negative impact. So I, I presume this is a question of something bad happening with your baby. No. Now we know if moms got infected with certain viruses, those can lead to infections in your baby. Um, but this is a vaccine. This is not an infection, nor is it the virus. So again, I would say um, a mom who's recently delivered, develops COVID-19, um, or a parent who has COVID-19, a grandparent who has COVID-19, and exposes an infant who has no immunity, the infant is at risk for COVID-19. And while we're very pleased to say for the most part, there aren't children who've died from COVID-19, there aren't many neonates and infants, they still can get sick. Infants can get sick, can land in the hospital with COVID-19 and spend time there. And the long-term outcome of COVID-19 infection in infants, obviously we don't know that yet because the virus has only been around for about 14 months at this point. So um, again, it's a risk benefit question. And I would say, if I were the parent, my question would be, what are the risks of COVID-19 to my child versus risk of vaccine to my child? And we know the vaccine is safe when it comes to the mRNA vaccines. So it's really how comfortable are you with the risk of COVID-19 in a child? Right. Right. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I hope Erica is listening to us right now. Um, uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, some of the studies that are upcoming in this population, doctor. Uh, you, you mentioned that the Moderna and Pfizer uh, themselves are planning some studies. Could you talk a little bit about those uh, in which people yes. can participate? Yeah. yeah, so they just announced the opening for pregnant persons. Uh, well, it's not just, I guess it's about four or five weeks at this point, but that's super exciting because it means we'll actually have data. Um, you can reach out to, you can actually go to their website and you can see where the clinical trial sites are and you can register to participate if you'd like. Not every person who uh, expresses interest in participating in the trial will be um, chosen to participate. It depends on your underlying health history. It depends on your pregnancy status, et cetera. And so 
but that's the first step is just expressing interest. So that's good. We also know that both uh, candidates are being tested in children as well, because I know for a lot of people, the next question is, what about my children? Can they be vaccinated? When can they be vaccinated? And so at the moment, the Moderna vaccine is um, approved for 18 and older. Pfizer for 16 and older. Um, the vaccines have actually been studied in children as young as 12, but not enough of them were included in the trials by the time the FDA reviewed the data. And so those are ongoing. And with um, luck, we'll actually have more data by midsummer is what the numbers are projecting. Um, remember, these trials are actually ongoing, not just in the United States, but for example, Pfizer is in six countries in terms of the Pfizer clinical trials for the vaccine and Moderna multiple countries as well. And so we're getting nice swaths of data, not just from an American population, but populations around the world with different exposures, different risks, and um, different demographics, including ethnic demographics. So that's super important. Um, and so there's more information coming. And speaking of that, for those who are concerned, well, how did they do all this so quickly? That is part of why we were able to get so much data so quickly from the clinical trials is they were studied not just in the US, but across the world in large population groups so that we actually have data from large groups of people. Typically, a phase two trial, we are at phase three trials, we're seeing somewhere in the order of 2,000 to 10,000 people studied. Studied. Between Pfizer and Moderna, there were almost 80,000 people studied wow. in those trials. So really strong data in terms of the numbers needed to study and see actual effects, side effects, impacts, etc. So I want people to know that too. It's not based on any small number in yeah. terms of the general data coming out. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. That was very helpful. Um, uh, and uh, we have an audience uh, question asking, are there studies collecting breast milk samples for moms who got vaccinated while breastfeeding? Yes, there are studies going on. Um, some of them right here in the US. Uh, there's one university based in Ohio, um, and they're, they're doing that. And then there are a couple here on the West Coast that are also studying a couple institutions, not a, not a couple, but um, they're also studying that. And it's going to be important because it helps to actually have the verification, just like we recently got the data that actually shows the presence of neutralizing antibodies in breast milk of moms who were previously infected with COVID-19. I would tell you, I had been saying that from day one, but it was nice to actually have studies that said, hey, in a SARS-CoV-2 infected person, now we have neutralizing antibodies. Um, and so that's the other reassuring thing though, is the data is holding true for what we would expect to see in this class of viruses. So that helps as well with some of the reassurance and guidance that we're able to give to patients and families is the science actually is holding up. What we expect to see is happening. And that brings me to my part that I promise I will come back to, which is how to keep yourself safe, whether you got the vaccine or not. The vaccine is an additional layer of safety. And I as someone who got the vaccine, I can't tell you how tremendously relieved I felt getting it when I didn't realize I needed relief. I didn't realize that I had been so anxious, I guess, about just the whole thought of this pandemic and what COVID-19 meant if I were to get it and what it meant for me as, for example, a solo practitioner and my staff and my clinic. Um, but the relief was it's indescribable, really. I'm not someone who gets teary-eyed, but I actually sat there just really teary-eyed so much so that someone came over and said, are you okay? Are you having symptoms? I was like, no, it's just, I can't believe that this is how I felt. And that's now being reported by many other people who got the vaccines. Um, we have high rates of anxiety. This in the last year, I have prescribed more anti-anxiety and antidepressant medicines than I had prescribed in the total three years before that. So we're all on edge and I get it. So what I recommend is continue washing your hands. Even if you live in states like Texas or Mississippi, if you're pregnant, those relaxing of the mandates, it's not for you. Wear your mask, double mask. If you don't have a two-ply, three-ply mask, double mask. Wash your hands. Be 
very judicious about who you expose yourself to. And so if you can't be sure that they're following the mask mandates, washing their hands, if they're telling you they don't believe SARS-CoV-2 is real, if they don't believe COVID-19 causes bad outcomes, don't hang out around these people when you're pregnant, especially. This is not the group for you while you're pregnant and not the group for your unborn child. Um, and so I really want people to hear that, know that. Um, eat a nutritious diet, you know, get your vitamin C, um, get your labs checked, you know, stay healthy, drink water, but at the very least, don't throw caution to the wind. Right, thank you, thank you. Good advice and very helpful advice, doctor. Um, just a couple of more questions before we wind up from the audience. Um, uh, so uh, I know you talked about how the vaccine is approved for 18 years and above and 16 year and above. So um, uh, this person was talking about breastfeeding and you answered a lot of, of different parts of her question, but she also asked how strong those antibodies that I pass through the breast milk to my child will be for my baby. So the term neutralizing antibody refers to the fact that if you, so I know the color changed on my skin because I have this green screen here, but I wanted to show the virus for a reason. So if you look at that spike, a neutralizing antibody would actually a lot of them will just glum on to the spike. And as they glum on to the spike, it makes the virus unable to get into a cell because those spikes are meant to bind to receptors on your cell and help the virus expel its RNA into the cell. And so neutralizing antibodies glom on to the spike and then prevent it from getting into cells. And so that's how we measure neutralizing antibodies. Now, ideally in the long term, we'll have tests where we can actually tell you you're titer because titer is how we determine antibody strength usually. Um, we, we're not doing titers right now. We're, it's really a positive versus negative test. But in actual research studies, and some people are doing research studies, they're looking at titers now to start determining what's the actual titer, meaning the mean leanest dilution you can go to and still have effectiveness of the antibodies. And so people are studying that now and we'll have that forthcoming. But for now, it's more a question of whether you have it or not. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and the final question. Um, so uh, we've seen that some women are having very strong reactions to the vaccine. And, and in a way you said that it is, it is okay. And it is, it should happen. Right. So uh, if someone does not have any reaction, does that mean that the vaccine is not effective for them? No, uh, really our immune systems are very diverse and our bodies respond differently. And so some people, their immune system gets amped up and so they're gonna spike a fever, which is you know normal. Um, others won't spike a fever, but it won't mean you're not doing the work. You're doing the work. It's just, you know, your body's a little bit calmer in how it does things, right? Um, and that's really what that is. So no, I would say, getting your vaccine if you don't see those things it doesn't mean it's not working and i actually think everybody gets the swelling everybody gets the swelling and the soreness so that is your sort of surefire sign that it happened right but you're probably not going to get a fever most people don't get a fever in fact and so if you don't have a fever it doesn't mean anything's weird um if you don't have body aches it doesn't mean anything weird um it's easy for one person in the household to feel like they got hit by a Mack truck for a couple of days while the other person just sails through or maybe just has mild soreness at the back of the head to let them know, yeah, I got a shot. Um, but no, it in no way means it didn't work for you. Um, and here's some reassuring stuff to, for everyone to know about the vaccines, even J&J. &J. All three of these vaccines have shown 100% ability to prevent death from COVID-19, that's huge, all three. All three have shown 100% ability to prevent severe COVID-19, meaning that ending up in the hospital on a ventilator, unable to be visited by your family members, et cetera. And so when we talk about efficacy, that primary part, which is what drives the fear in most of us, right? I mean, for me, that was my big fear about SARS-CoV-19 um, infection is not just getting infected, but what if I ended up being one of those people who has to be in the hospital, you know, and very sick or long hauler syndrome. So 100% effective there. 
We also now know coming out of Israel, data coming out of Israel shows that people who got the vaccines actually have lower amounts of viral particles if they were to become infected later on, meaning they're the inoculum that they can spread is less. That is what we expected, so that's awesome to have it verified. We know with the J&J vaccine, it's actually less transmissibility of the virus following um, vaccine. And so it all holds true in terms of what we know about the principles of virology and vaccine biology for viruses. And so that's all really exciting and reassuring, but I really want people to hear that part because that is the whole purpose of why we were praying for vaccines is so we can turn this from a deadly or highly morbid disease to one where if you got infected, your body fights it off, you clear it at home, and you move on with your life. You don't overwhelm the healthcare system so that pregnant women are now afraid to go to the hospital to deliver. And so that's the benefit of these vaccines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Duke. Um, Great information. Thank you for sharing all of this great information. And I'm sure it will be very helpful for women who are planning to take the vaccine and who took it already. Um, so thank you for everything. Davina and Valerie, thanks for joining and guiding the panel with your very insightful questions. And I also th thank, thank um, everyone in the audience who are listening and who posted their queries for Dr. Duke. Uh, this talk and transcript will be available for everybody um, on QDocs.com as well as on the YouTube channel. Stay tuned uh, for you know information on more upcoming talks on QDocs.com. So until next time, everybody have a great day and stay safe. Thank you so much.